This talk is or was inspired by two different quotes. The first quote is from Steve Freeman. He lives in London. He's been a uh, agile person for a long, long time since around before the the Agile Manifesto was written, and I was corresponding with him around this talk, uh, about this talk, and he wrote, in our day, we were fighting waterfall. I think they're fighting coloring by numbers Agile. Uh, both Steve and I are old. I'm not sure that anybody under 50 really knows what a coloring by number, or as we call it in the US, a paint by number kit is. But basically, you've got this drawing, and the white spaces are numbered, and you've got a set of paints that are also labeled with those numbers, and you have a paintbrush, and you wet it, and you take the paint, and you paint num color number one, you find all the number ones in there, and you paint that whatever the number one color is, and then you continue through all, all the numbers on the, on the image, and when you're done, you have something that's not particularly satisfying. It doesn't really look very much like a painting, and it doesn't actually, and this is important for this talk, it doesn't actually teach you very much about how to do real paintings, even though that's what they were sold as doing. Okay, so that's quote number one. Uh, quote number two is from this gentleman, uh, I forgot his first name, Peter Thiel. Uh, he was one of the founders of PayPal, which is not as bad as everyone says, in my opinion, but uh, is an excellent example of first mover advantage and how you can uh, harness a monopoly to uh, gain lots of users and lots of money. And like lots of billionaires, Peter Thiel, huh, he's like programmers. He has really strong opinions about everything. And uh, this is a clipping from the Chicago Tribune, which is uh, one of the two newspapers in Chicago, which is a town in central the center part of America, and he said to this audience in Chicago that if you are a very talented person, you have a choice. You either go to New York or you go to Silicon Valley. Now, Chicago is not either one of those places, and uh, it's sort of a testament to his personal skills that he was actually surprised that people in Chicago didn't receive this message very well. Uh, they, they seemed not to like the idea of being untalented uh, and stuck behind in some loser town doing loser things that untalented people do. Now, Peter Thiel is, as far as I know, American. Uh, and as an American, he is unaware of the existence of other countries. But were he aware of it, he would probably put London in the list of where very talented people go, uh, and he would probably include Warsaw in where the losers stay. Um, so, hello, losers. Um, I'm, I'm even more of a loser than people in Chicago, because I live in a little town that's uh, about 200, 250 kilometers south of Chicago. So that's where the people who couldn't even be talented enough for Chicago go. Okay, so those are the two motivating quotes. Uh, we just heard a panel about the future of Agile, and so I thought it would be an interesting idea to, for me to continue on from that panel by giving you some advice for why for how you will build the future of Agile. And I'll say more about uh, why I'm highlighting you in a little bit. Now, I do want to warn you uh, about something. So this conference is a nice conference, and I am uh, very in tune with its, with its style, which is to prevent, present case studies, it's to pre present ideas that you can take home and experiment, really concrete, practical things. I'm very much into examples. My company name, the one before this one, 
when I was an Agile consultant was called exampler.com. So I like examples, I like really concrete things, but that's not what this talk is going to be. So uh, it's going to be a, what I think of as a, a big think talk. I'm going to not tell you things you can actually do, but try and uh, give you a new way of seeing the world. Okay, so that's by way of preface. Um, so if you want concrete things to do, you won't get many, but you will get an interesting fact about cows that you can tell to people. Um, because I mentioned that my wife is a veterinarian, her specialty is uh, dairy cows. Um, she knows, at one time she was uh, a world expert in dairy cow, a particular disease of dairy cows, uh, mastitis which is the number one economically significant disease of dairy cattle in the world. That's not the interesting fact, though. Um, so she is a professor at the University of Illinois. And at the time this slide was taken, her job was to teach veterinary students how to become veterinarians. And I don't know how, the, how they do it in, in Europe. Uh, my impression is it's pretty much the same as in the US. I believe certainly in the UK it is. But the way you do that is the last year of your veterinary school experience is, is entirely devoted to what they call rotations where you treat animals or you learn how to take x-rays of animals and so on and so forth. But in her case, students would come in and their job would be to learn how to treat cattle typically uh, those kind of cattle, because that is the world's best producing breed of dairy cattle, a Holstein or Frisian, as they call them, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, so the way that they, the way a student learns to treat an animal, uh, treat animals, is animal comes in, it's assigned to a student. That student carries the animal through the course of its treatment to the point where it either dies or gets better. And so the beginning of a day for a student involves the student coming in and doing what's called a SOAP, which stands for Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. And that involves taking their temperature, taking blood pressure, all of those things you're probably familiar with. It also involves uh, evaluating the animal along a scale, three or a three-bit scale, basically. They have to write down, is the animal bright or dull? Is it alert or depressed? Is it responsive or non-responsive? Now, the last two are easy to learn. Uh, she could teach you how to tell whether a cow is responsive or unresponsive in, in a matter of minutes. But bright and dull, whether a cow is bright or dull, is much more difficult to learn. And here's how they learn. So the student comes in in the morning, writes down that the cow is bright. Uh, students almost always err on the side of thinking an animal is bright when it's actually dull. Then Dawn waltzes in, or whatever clinician is, is working then, comes in, and they do rounds. So she goes, Dawn goes, with all the animals around all the stalls, and she looks at the record, and she looks at the cow and she says something like, oh, that cow's not bright, it's dull. Now, the student asks, why? Why is the cow dull? And Dawn will say, oh, look, its ears are droopy. And so all these little veterinary students, they're not really little, they're like 25 years old, but all these vet students go, ah, the cow looks bright, but it has droopy ears, then it's dull. So they put a rule in their head. So time passes, this happens you know, over and over again. And at some point, there comes a cow with a droopy ear. The student, maybe a different student, maybe the same student, writes down that the cow is dull. So they go around, they do the rounds, and then uh, Dawn says, oh, that cow's bright. And the student says, but its ears are droopy. And Don will say, but it's cleaning its nose. 
And so the, uh, the, the students will add a new rule to their repertoire of rules. If the cow has droopy ears, but it's cleaning its nose, then it's bright. So for those of you who don't know cows, uh, the way cows clean their ears is they lick the inside of their nostril with their tongues. Now, so you learned something. It, did, did anyone know that before? See, it's actually kind of charming once you get used to it, the way they do it. Uh, but that's not directly the point of this talk. Um, now I'm, okay, back up. Um, the interest, so time passes. The students eventually become capable of determining whether an animal is bright or dull. That is, they will reliably make the same judgment as a trained cow doctor. But the really neat thing is, in the process of learning to make that distinction, they've lost all those rules. Once you're a trained veterinarian, like my wife, you look at a cow, sorry to use you as an example, <laughs> you, you look at a cow and you just immediately see whether the cow is bright or dull. It's just obvious, it's impossible not to notice whether a cow is bright or dull. So what's happened is their behavior, their skill has gone from the realm of rules and algorithms to the realm of perception. And so it's really the same as any of you laughing at something I said. You didn't run through an algorithm that said, you know, American guy said this thing, is he threatening? No. Um, did he say funny things? Did he make fun of Trump? Yes, he's a good guy. Uh, therefore, I will laugh. You, you simply laugh. Now, if I asked you after the fact, why did you laugh? You might give a reason. Just in the same way when a student asks, why is that cow dull? Don, my wife's name is Don. Don will give a reason. But the reason comes after the fact. It's, she didn't think the cow is dull because it has droopy ears. It's more, why is the cow dull? Uh, ah, there's a, something I can explain. Droopy ears. Okay? That is characteristic of expert behavior. Uh, acting appropriately without necessarily being able to explain why you acted appropriately. There's a nice book on this topic by Gary Klein called Sources of Power. I'm going to have a list of references at the end of this so you can copy that down if you want. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to give a name to what Don is doing here. Uh, and what I'm going to use is, as a source is this book by James C. Scott, Seeing Like a State, uh, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on the failure part. I'm going to dwell on a different part of the book. And he introduces a term called metis. Metis is from the Greek. I think I've got the pronunciation right. And it means something like, the, the literal definition from the Greek means something like the knowledge that can come only from practical experience. But Scott wants to extend this idea. He wants to say that metis is better understood as the kind of knowledge that can be acquired only by long practice at similar but rarely identical tasks, which requires constant adaptation to changing circumstances. And you can see the, you can envision the training of a student to understand bright and dull as fitting this pattern. You've got a succession of different cows, they're suffering from different diseases, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The same is true of, of jokes. You learn to laugh at jokes by being ex exposed to lots and lots of jokes and everyone's staring at you wondering why you're the one who didn't get it. So, Metis is, I think, a key idea. And what I want to claim is that the history of Agile 
uh, and the Agile Manifesto is very much bound up with this idea of Metis. That is, there were people who had that practical knowledge built out of repeated similar circumstances that were operating in all sorts of little different uh, teams and projects in various scattered companies. And I'm representing those scattered companies or those scattered teams as, uh, as the, those are actually maps of a medieval village. So, but think of each one of them as being a team of some sort. These people understood Metis. They understood the Metis of agility. They knew how to do this sort of thing the same way that uh, Dawn knows how to do treating cows. And they knew they were all doing something kind of similar. And they knew each other because these people were on the same mailing lists. We didn't have Slack back then, or else we would have never accomplished anything. Uh, when they were on the same mailing lists, they uh, were, did a lot of stuff together on the original wiki, the C2 wiki, which was a few years old back then. They went to the same conferences, Oopsla conference, the Pattern Languages of Programs conference. And so they knew each other, and then two of those people, uh, Bob Martin and Alistair Coburn, got, decided to invite these people together to try and figure out two things. One was uh, what these people had in common, what they were all doing that was similar, so abstracting away from the particulars, and to pick a name, because these were called, at the time, lightweight processes, and that was not nearly so marketable as agile, because nobody wants to be seen as a lightweight, but everybody wants to be seen as agile. So, they all went to, uh, we all went to a mountaintop in Utah, that's the actual mountain, and they wrote, we wrote the Agile Manifesto, though I will give you a, a, a secret about the writing of the Anima Agile Manifesto. The first day of the meeting was a disaster, and my recollection uh, is that two people, one of them, Martin Fowler, went off in a back room and produced the Agile Manifesto in almost its final form and came back and put it up on the wall and said, how about this? And all of these alpha males that had been going, rrr, 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 I'm an alpha male, uh, went, hey, that looks pretty good, and then, poof, the Agile Manifesto. The only problem with that theory is Martin Fowler I talked to him about it, and he thought the same thing happened, but he didn't think he was one of the two people. So we have no way of knowing what really went on there, which is a, interesting when you think about eyewitness testimony in court cases and such. Uh, so anyway, uh, most of you have probably seen the Agile Manifesto. I want to compare it, though, to bright and dull cows, because what's happened is we introduced words into the world. And I want to say those words are like bright and dull for cows. They are names of things that are difficult to describe, but somehow are clearly associated with our task at hand, building software or making a cow uh, better. So as an example of what I meant, the, as I say, I haven't been doing uh, consulting or coaching or anything like that for, for a number of years, so I don't know if this debate is, is still going on, but working software kind of got translated in, at a certain point into, well, the story should be done before you move off of it, and then people started to, know, started to wonder, well, what are the rules behind whether something's done? And does it have to go all the way into production? Well, no, we don't want that. So we'll say when it's in production, it's done, done. But if it's just checked in, it's just done, and yada, 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 yada. And that's exactly like, to my point of view, the rules for whether a cow is bright or dull. If you're a person with Metis, if you're a person who understands Agile, has really got it, 
you walk into a place, you see what they're doing, you can tell whether they've really got the working software thing or not. You can tell whether their software is such that there's only a, you know, they're not going to have to revisit decisions over and over again. You can tell that they've got the pacing right so that they'll be able to add new features without it being a disaster. So working software is a token that points in a general direction that is accessible to people with Metis who've had this kind of practice, but is only very weakly captured by rules like the rules behind when something's done versus done done. So, what went wrong uh, with Agile? Why is it that people like me and Steve Freeman and Dave Thomas and Keith Braithwaite and Andy Hunt are all old grumpy men uh, saying, well, why is it that you know, these kids nowadays aren't doing, they're not really getting Agile? Uh, the problem is that Agile was successful, and we saw that, wherever it went, that exponential curve. What happened was, and his curve is right, the curve of projects needing people with Metis to teach other people how to do Agile, like my wife teaches veterinary students how to do veterinary medicine, the, the, the number of teams that needed that greatly uh, exceeded the supply of coaches. So you had people like me in my day, uh, since I live in loser land, 200 kilometers south of Chicago, I couldn't be you know, a Henrik where I'm on site all the time teaching them with my presence. I had to sort of go fly in and then fly away, you know, give them some advice, fly away, maybe come back next month, give them some more advice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, the kind of advice I was giving is, look for the droopy ears. I'm not teaching them uh, Metis, because Metis, this kind of thing, is historically taught by apprenticeship. Doctors learn from other doctors. Um, mathematicians, proofs are very formal, but the business of being a mathematician, the, all of the things that go around actually getting the idea for the proof, that is, that's the sort of thing that is learned by apprenticeship to an existing we call them thesis advisor in the middle of ages. They would be the master to the apprentice. Okay, so what you get out of the kind of shallow dive-in stuff that I used to do is rules and not meet us. So that's my challenge to you. This is what I want all of you to do uh, going on from here, is I want you to figure out how to solve that exponential curve where the need is growing exponentially and the supply is growing linearly. Um, so you need to figure out how to do this kind of apprenticeship style learning that leads to meet us without the presence of the master to, or the sensei, or the whatever, to teach you this stuff the way my wife teaches software. And then I want you to uh, spread that knowledge uh, by figuring it out, getting together at this place uh, up there, uh, and writing the, the next version of the Agile Manifesto. That happens to be uh, where my father was born, um, and I'm going to visit there tomorrow and take pictures for him, because he hasn't been back there since uh, World War II. He was German, sorry. <laughs> but all the Germans are gone now, so. Okay.
so there's actually a reason, not just flattery. And oh, by the way, Romanians, I know about half of you are not Polish, I was told. You get to come too. This is not just a Polish only thing. Uh, but you don't, don't invite people from New York or Silicon Valley because they'll spoil everything. And I'm actually uh, serious about that. Here's a quote from uh, Keith Braithwaite, another guy who's been involved in Agile uh, forever. He says, I moved to a small town in rural Cumbria. I have no idea where that is. Uh, I assume it's in England. Uh, in the company there, we did extreme programming and we did it well because we wanted to and because we could. We didn't need anyone's permission and we didn't need to fight anyone. And some more text that I'll skip over. Only a client who wanted to get stuff done would bother with this small specialist outfit in the middle of nowhere. And that isolation was that isolation like that and other kinds of isolation were, in my opinion, crucial to the development of Agile. Because Agile, these little projects that formed, uh, maybe some of them were geographically remote, but I think by and large, and the vast majority of them were organizationally remote. A typical case would be, a project had been going on, it was a complete disaster. The company basically threw up its hands and said, you do whatever crazy thing you want, it can't be any worse than we've got now. So the very first XP project was done in Detroit, not New York, uh, and it was for Chrysler. It was a project that was disastrous and they brought in Kent Beck and he basically told them, well, you gotta get rid of almost all of the people and start over from scratch. And they said, okay. Uh, and thus was born the original XP project. The, uh, the first scrum project that um, Ken Schwaber worked at was also a project that had been failing and he was given more or less carte blanche to, to take it over. Um, other projects were projects that weren't failing, but they were kind of off in the corner. They weren't the, the sexy, neat projects. They were just people who sat there in their rooms and didn't bother anyone and caused no fuss and just produced software. And so people left them alone. You're not, I believe, going to get that in New York or London maybe London, because there's still a lot of those old timers around and they're, they're, you know, keep calm and carry on tough people, but not in uh, New York or Silicon Valley, because those places are oriented very, very, very heavily around short-term rewards. We got to make bonuses this year. We got to make, we got to have a unicorn startup. We got to get from where we are to the place where we can s sell ourselves to Google before they notice what they're actually getting, and so on and so forth. So there's this attitude of go big or go home that is not very conducive to the patient development of something like a process, because they're not going, over iter going for iterative improvement of how they work, They've got expensive people they're hiring that are in an incredibly expensive place to live, and those people are not there to learn. They're there to produce money uh, to be reaped by venture capitalists and the CEO. Okay, so that's your job. Uh, I don't know how to do this, but I do have a suggestion uh, because I do, I do read weird books, and I read weird books that talk about creativity. This is not as weird a book as, as many I read, uh, because it's about how professionals act in practice and how you should teach professionals, note, by an apprenticeship system. Um, but I keep seeing over and over again that creative professionals both learn and act 
in a particular way. And I think Schoen, the person here, captures it nicely. He calls it reflection in practice, uh, where in, in this sense, in is one of those uh, English uh, prepositions that means about 300 different things. Here he means during, reflecting during practice. So uh, I saw, I think I saw a whole bunch of hands go up earlier at one talk when somebody mentioned the, the Schuert Deming cycle, plan, plan how you're going to improve quality typically, uh, do, execute the plan, check did you actually accomplish an improvement in quality and act, solidify your accomplishment, make it part of the normal process of the company so you can move to the next planning cycle. Um, what Schuert and many other people observe is that professionals in action kind of jumble the, all, of those peop, all of those things together. So if you're familiar with exploratory testing, as opposed to the plan style testing that used to be common in the days before Agile. This is very much the same thing as exploratory testing. And so that's what, that's what regular practitioners do. And there's two things that happen during practice that uh, Schoen calls out and that I want to call out for you. One is that when you're doing this practice, you will encounter surprises. Some, you expected something, and that something didn't happen. And to show them, that's very important because the surprise is the thing that makes you stop and start asking questions. Like, what just happened? What was I expecting that was different than what I got? So what made me expect the things I was expecting? And if you read this kind of literature on creativity, the reaction to a surprise goes at all levels of abstraction. Um, for example, it's very typical to, as a result of surprise, change the goal you were trying to, trying to achieve. So it's not a matter of, you know, product owner gives you the story with all the acceptance criteria and you faithfully implement it, it quite often is the case that you faithfully, oh, that's weird, and you go talk to the product owner and you change the, what the story's all about. So the other thing that Sean talks about is the importance of experimenting right in the middle of doing the action. And he says, something that he says is that often when you do this experiment, the stuff you're working on will push back at you. Now that's an, an interesting phrase. Um, it's interesting because of course, it's not really pushing back, but if you look at different fields, Create different creative fields, there's always this sort of notion of the thing you're working on pushing back. Back in the pattern days, Kent Beck had a book called um, Small Talk Best Practice Patterns, and in the introduction to the book, he talked about, oh, the software's trying to tell us something, maybe we should listen. My wife, uh, veterinarians, refer to will say things like, the animal is trying to die. So it's, it's, it's like the animal is deliberately trying to die. It's not a passive participant. It's like, I really want to die. And you hear uh, writers, novelists, they'll say, I, you know, I had a plot, I had the characters, but the characters decided to go their own way. So I don't think that imaginary characters are really making decisions in opposition to the author of the book they're in. But I think there's clearly something going on in the way people approach activities that people are trying to put a name to, like you put a name to bright or dull, and there's something about the act of doing an experiment immediately after doing reflection that opens up a lot of different possibilities. And 
This is hard to get without examples. I recommend Schoen's book, uh, this particular one. The, the earlier book is not nearly so readable, but this one's pretty good. Okay, so what the coach does in an Agile project, um, not an Agile project, but if you're an architect helping a student do the student's practice drawings, uh, maybe they're required to design a school and they get they're showing their preliminary work to the, the seasoned architect, and that architect will ask questions like, or will say things like, that's odd, because students don't have the vocabulary, they don't have the way to even think about the design process, so they can't really notice the, the, the surprises that an experienced person would. So the coach will say, that's odd. They'll say, let's try this now. Let's sketch this thing because students tend to be focused on getting from where I am to getting to the end. They don't take advantage of the opportunity to experiment. Uh, are we going in the right direction? Is this really the right goal for us to have? And importantly, think of it this way. Uh, so they're using words to kind of nail down hard to express ideas about the kind of design that that profession does. So working software doesn't mean it's definition, it's like a signpost that's pointing to an area that people who are, have Metis understand. Okay, whoops, roll of the coach. Okay, now in Agile projects, the way people do learning is the retrospective, and that doesn't work. That, I shouldn't say that doesn't work, because obviously retrospectives are valuable, but retrospectives do not fit the model of uh, reflection in practice, because the reflection happens a long time after the moment of surprise, the experimenting is something that, oh, we noticed this problem a week ago, so next week let's do this thing. There's not, the feedback loop is not fast enough for what Shown describes. So uh, I don't have, like I said, this is your job to deal with this, but I want, you, I want to give you some ideas to think about. Uh, so you want to think in whatever work you do, a, I think mostly in terms of programming because that's what I am. You want to work on sensitivity to surprise and how to do useful experimentation. So um, sensitivity to surprise, I think one of the most important things, uh, so I'm unusual in a lot of ways, but I don't think I'm unusual in this way. When I, it is often, too often the case, that I'll be coding along, coding along, coding along, and, and I'll say, oh God, this, this just, this is not going well. I gotta work myself out of this trap. It is almost always the case that at that moment, looking at this mess I've created, I remember when I was writing that bit of code a week ago, Something was bugging me about it, but I ignored it because I'm kind of a compulsive programmer type person. Uh, so it's easy for me to ignore that little voice that's saying something's going on instead of being surprised. I think it might even be harder to be surprised when you're pair programming because you don't want to be wasting your pair's time. Um, speaking of pair programming, I don't know entirely if this is the case so much, but in the early days of XP, people, there was a notion that when you're doing pair programming, you have the driver who is typing away, and you have the navigator who is keeping track of where you're going and if you're going in the right direction. So looking at, a, at things at a different level. Now, you would switch back and forth pretty fluidly, but there was that separation of roles, which it seems to me has since sort of dissolved into mush. That is, 
both people, when they're pair programming, are essentially doing the same sort of role. I wonder if it wouldn't be better to have one person of the pair uh, deliberately charged with trying to find those little surprises before they turn into a big mess. And the dot, dot, dot means these ideas are probably pretty lame, uh, but you guys, before you meet in that town's name that I probably should learn how to pronounce before I go there, uh, you're going to figure it out and go there and, and write it down. Um, as far as useful experimentation goes, I, even, I have even less to offer, uh, except there's an interesting little thread in the programming world that's been going on for a while and kind of bubbling below the surface, and that's the idea of being really aggressive about throwing away code. Now that, the idea of throwing away code is not something that comes very naturally to me. Uh, this is our basement after about a month of throwing things away. So I'm not good at that, but there are people who are talking about using throwing code away uh, in, a, in a thoughtful way in the process of programming. So the Mikado method is a pretty short, pretty easy read book, uh, an idea that seems pretty simple. It's for large scale refactoring. The idea of the Mikado method is you start saying, I'm going to refactor this code, you refactor, 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 keep the test passing, keep the test passing, and then you run into a problem where there's a big step, for example, you can't do without having the test be broken for a long time. The interesting thing, that now my natural tendency is then to just bull ahead and fix that problem. What they do with the Mikado method is they say, okay, when you've done that, throw the code away that you just wrote, put that on your to-do list, and now focus on solving the problem you have. When you try to solve that problem, you'll find other problems in the process of writing code. You throw all that code away until you have this kind of graph of all the things that need to be done, and then you work your way in, basically rewriting a lot of the code you threw away, but probably better than the first time you did it. And it's weird to do, but as I do it more and more, I'm starting to get accustomed to it. Uh, the guy with the cat is Corey Haynes. He's the CTO of Harkin, which is a Chicago company. Uh, and he, their team is actually experimenting with an approach that doesn't have a catchy name, but the idea goes like this. If you have a story that's estimated to be three days long, Start working on the story. Code, 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 code. Five o'clock, go home. Come back the next day, delete all the code, start again. Code, 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 code. Now, the second time you do that, two things are going to happen. One, the second time you do it, it goes a lot faster than the first time. Two, you very might well do it slightly differently because you have a better idea. So this time, maybe you get far. You get farther. Code, 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 code. Oh, up. Oh, end of the day. Okay. Next day, throw it all away, and you repeat this process until you get to the point where you can do all the code in one day. That's so strange. That's so crazy. Um, but they're doing it, and it's. I'm actually an investor in their company in a small way, but he's actually throwing away some of my money every day when he throws away this code. Uh, and I, I encourage him to do this. I haven't really gotten, I, I can't quite do that yet, but I'm getting there. And that's the kind of experimentation uh, that I think we need to see more of in Agile. Um, so here's a strange idea. Um, Suppose you used Corey's technique in a meeting. You're practicing the practice of a meeting. Someone notes a moment of surprise. 
So you throw the meeting away and you start again. Because everybody loves meetings and so they'll be super happy to do that. So I would like you people to try that. I would be happy to try that, except my company has one person in it. Uh, so we don't have very many meetings. Um, but I think that my concluding slide is that these kinds of weird ideas are important for the future of Agile because I remember, you know, 1999, 2000, thereabouts. Agile seems like, uh, not that weird now, um, but in 2000, especially XP, those guys were crazy. Like, the second stupidest idea I had ever heard of was pair programming. Because of all the, you know, you're wasting time, one guy's going to be bored, you've got two people doing the work that one person could do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until I actually did pairing that I started to, under to understand the benefits. Now, the first stupidest idea was open workspaces, because I was one of those people who loved my office, and I couldn't work when people were talking around me. And so I thought that open workspaces would be just complete hell on earth. But I actually found myself enjoying them. One of the reasons is because of pair programming. Because when you're pairing, you're focused on the conversation you're having with your pair, but your ears are still slightly cocked, if you just do that, uh, listening for conversations that make you go, hey, whoa, you're doing what? And it doesn't, the, because of the focus on pairing, the surrounding noise becomes beneficial rather than harmful. So I think that there are still a lot of weird ideas uh, left to discover in Agile. And I think that you are the obviously right people to find those weird ideas. So that's it. <laughs>